Tonight, stopping fentanyl at the source, Britain sours on Brexit, and Santa in the Seventh Ward. In a strong show of defiance against President Trump, 128 countries voted in favor of a UN resolution, demanding that the US rescind its recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Nine countries voted against the non-binding resolution, and 35 abstained, including Canada and Mexico. Trump had threatened to pull aid from any country that voted for it. This vote will make a difference on how Americans look at the UN and on how we look at countries who disrespect us in the UN. And this vote will be remembered. Today, six people who were arrested when they attended a protest on President Trump's inauguration day were found not guilty on charges of rioting and property destruction. It was the first trial for those known as the J-20 defendants, a group of nearly 200 people charged after the events of January 20th. Prosecutors argued the defendants who were cleared today, including a freelance journalist, were trying to use the First Amendment as a cover for taking part in criminal activity. They've also taken the position that anyone in the vicinity of the property damage done that day is responsible for it. The trials for the remaining 188 defendants are expected to begin early next year. I think if similar results are found for other cases, other trials within this case, it will send a message that these actions are protected by the Constitution and the jury will find them protected. For the first time, the Pentagon has issued guidance on how transgender individuals will be admitted into the military, starting January 1st. Despite President Trump's efforts to ban transgender people from serving, the military said earlier this month it would allow them to sign up, after a ruling in a court case challenging the ban. The memo outlining the new guidelines says transgender people will be able to join the armed forces according to their preferred gender, meaning the person's room and bathroom assignments, underwear requirements, and medical exams will be carried out based on the person's gender choice. Memphis has become the latest city to remove Confederate statues. For months, the city council has been trying to take down the two monuments, but Tennessee state law prevented it. So last night, council members voted to sell the two city parks where the statues were located to a nonprofit organization. Immediately following the sale, the statues of Jefferson Davis and Nathan Bedford Forrest came down. The parks will remain open to the public. Sixty percent of international packages received by the U.S. Postal Service arrive here at New York's JFK, the busiest mail port in the country. A million packages per day come through this facility. At this time of year, that usually means Christmas gifts and care packages, but these customs officers are hunting for something else. Frank Russo is the port director for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. His team of 100 officers is on the lookout for illegal drugs, especially fentanyl a highly dangerous synthetic opioid that's now flowing into the country at a record rate. So you see they're, they're protected, they have their gloves on, they have a mask on, and they're gonna open up a package and see what they find. CBP didn't start tracking how much fentanyl it intercepted until October 2015. But over the next year, it found 459 pounds. In 2017, it found 1,296 pounds. They'll try anything. Uh, we, we see uh, the, the fentanyl coming in toys, we see it coming in food products, uh, you name it, and, and they'll try to, to use it. And what technology are you using to screen for the fentanyl? We use uh, spectrometry, uh, where we can shoot a laser at a package without having to open up the package. That's critically important for our officers to make sure that they're safe. Not having to reach the package to identify what it is that we're working with is extremely useful for law enforcement purposes. You know, for our safety, for everybody's safety. Here we go, that's this one. And this is actually cut with something else. We've uh, introduced canine uh, uh, training to detect fentanyl. And uh, just in the last few months, they've made over 10 fentanyl seizures. This year, Frank Russo's team made 84 fentanyl seizures, up from just seven last year. When the officers determine they have a package that contains fentanyl, it's set aside for testing. And they have to be very careful. 
inhaling just two milligrams, the equivalent of a few grains of salt, can be deadly. It really comes down to training, to look at packages, determine which are good and which are bad. Countries that, that a package is coming from is usually an indicator of, of high risk. Most of the fentanyl that we see is actually all of it that we see is from China and Hong Kong. In October, the Department of Justice announced the first ever indictments of two Chinese nationals accused of shipping fentanyl to the United States. Fentanyl and fentanyl analogs are coming into the country in numerous ways, including shipments from factories in China directly to U.S. customers who make those purchases over the internet. We contacted the Chinese government to ask about fentanyl coming into the U.S and were granted a rare interview with an official from the Chinese equivalent of the DEA. Chinese中方并未掌握这两名犯罪嫌疑人违反中国法律的证据。美国的同事呢，也没有提供相应的证据。所以呢，目前我们现在这个嫌疑的情况呢，还没有到一个呃起诉或者是控制的局情况。美方
We need something to help us out because nothing's helped us out so far. Grimsby has been struggling. The city once hosted the largest fishing fleet in the world, but it began to face major competition when other countries that share the North Sea wanted a piece of its success. So business had to adapt. Instead of catching fish, Grimsby now processes fish. As an EU country, Britain can cheaply and easily receive products from EU trading partners, like Iceland and Norway, process them and sell them onto the continent. When Britain leaves the EU, it could also leave the customs union, the common market and associated trade agreements with EU partners. The challenge this will present to Grimsby's major industry is obvious. So why then did 70% of people here vote for it? Um, it's a personal question, but did you vote out or in? I, you know, I voted out, oddly enough. Uh, today, why? would I vote out? Can you tell me why well, you did that? Because, you know, it kind of doesn't matter what you do, do something. And actually, what we should do is just get on with it. And the uncertainty is what really panics markets. Patrick Salmon buys haddock at the market to supply his artisan smoked fish business. So this year alone, we've seen price of fish go up 20, 30%. And that's due to Brexit in part. You know, the fall in the pound dramatically hit our industry. There's no question. Nobody would refute that. He sells wholesale to high-end restaurants in the UK and had hoped to start exporting soon. We've filleted all the fresh haddock this morning and we're now loading each house, which is a four-man operation. So that's a traditional way of doing it. Is there any way that you're going to have to change your business at all in light of what Brexit might throw up? Yeah, do you know, if supplies become in any way restricted, rather than selling to wholesalers at low margins, big volumes, I could specialise this smokehouse in supplying the public directly, so that would work. In the absence of meaningful government assessments of the impact of Brexit on business sectors, the local trade body representing Grimsby's fish processors knows exactly what it wants. Frictionless borders when it comes to the customs checks, no increase in tariffs on seafood, and access to migrant workers. It also favours special free trade status for regional ports. Essentially, to preserve the trade arrangement, the town voted to disrupt. But no one can say whether Brexit negotiations will allow any exceptions for Fish or Grimsby. You've held this view yeah. that Britain shouldn't be a part of the EU mm. since the 1970s. Why hasn't and your opinion changed over that course of that time? Because I am of that view irrespective of the impact on the economy. Having got Britain out of the EU, even committed Brexiteers like local MP Martin Vickers aren't looking for too much change. We need some sort of a system that will allow fr the, f the free movement of, it, of the fish. And I think... Uh, the, One of the benefits of being in the EU. Well, no, no, because, you know, they were still having to travel through Norway, for example. So what we want to ensure is, is that there are no barriers put in their way. But you don't know whether there will be barriers or not, do you? Well, <laughs> there you will, don't, there, do you? There, you cannot uh, assume that there won't be, but there is no reason to assume that there will be. <laughs> Can you foresee a situation in which you would vote against the final deal? I would very much doubt it, but you, you know, uh, you, you're leading me into the thing that politicians should never do and, ask the hi uh, and answer the hypothetical question. But everything it, it about is, Brexit is hypothetical. It, assume, it, it assumes a bad deal. Why would the EU want to uh, harm itself by not coming up with a deal that allowed trade and business to continue, not exactly as it is now, but in a, very, in, a, in a very similar arrangement. The government's department for exiting the EU told us in a statement that they are pursuing the best deal for places like Grimsby and are committed to the freest possible trade with the EU. Grimsby is a long way from Westminster. Brexit's progress so far hasn't brought politicians and people here any closer together. They've made a balls of it, OK? We got delivered a message that was wrong, there were lies. But this is an opportunity for brand UK, brand Britain, brand Grimsby to really get out there and, and look after itself. Yesterday, President Trump commuted the prison sentence of Shalom Rubashkin, the former CEO of Agriprocessors, a meatpacking plant in Postville, Iowa. Rubashkin was arrested in the wake of one of the largest immigration raids in U.S. history. He was ultimately sentenced to 27 years for bank fraud and money laundering. But his sentence wasn't the biggest consequence of the raid. When immigration and customs enforcement agents descended on the plant in May 2008, 
They detained nearly 400 people, almost 20% of the town's population. Many were workers from Mexico and Guatemala. Ever since, Postville has become synonymous with the government's militarized approach to immigration enforcement, and the effects of the raid are still being felt. Entonces, hmm, un día, 12 de mayo, 2008, eh, día normal, entramos a trabajar. Alicia, an undocumented immigrant from Mexico, had been living in Postville with her family since 2001 and working at Agri Processors, a massive processing plant for kosher meats. Entre 9.20 y 9.30 de la mañana, eh, empezaron a correr las personas, unas por un lado, otras por otro. Y cuando yo escuché, eh, cayó migración, pues yo sentí que me quedé paralizada, no pude correr, no pude nada. Entonces cuando yo bajé las, cuando ya bajé el último escalón fue cuando me agarró una, una gente y, y pues ahí sentí que, que me fui a un pozo muy hondo y ahí se me rompió todo. 389 workers were shackled and loaded into waiting buses. Two helicopters circled above. Y ahí estuvimos por, por lo menos algunas ocho horas en el camión. Alicia was released with an ankle monitor, but she was one of very few who made it out that day. The rest were detained for weeks in buildings designed to house livestock. Panicked families pulled their kids from school and gathered at St. Bridget's Catholic Church. Luz Maria Hernández, a Spanish teacher, showed up to volunteer as an interpreter. I remember that sometimes when you ask them something, they they were telling you the same answer over and over, so you knew that they were in shock. For a week, the church felt like an emergency shelter after a natural disaster. And Postville itself was desolate. Like these Western towns from the movies, where you are expected or fearful that the bad guys are going to come. Alicia qualified for a special visa to stay in the country, but her brother was deported, leaving his son behind. Lately, social scientists have been taking a new look at Postville, including Arlene Geronimus at the University of Michigan. For almost 40 years, Geronimus has studied a process she calls weathering, the long-term adverse effects that poverty and prejudice can have on the health of racial minorities. It was a raid that happened without any warning. So there's a clear day it happened on, a clear time, and it certainly wasn't subtle. And so as we saw it, we could use that kind of as a natural experiment before and after. So Geronimus and her team looked at data from Iowa birth certificates, measuring premature births and low birth weight among Hispanic women. And there's this one spike, and it happens right after the Postville raid. Geronimus concluded that the raid had created shockwaves of stress that rippled out beyond those directly affected, and that people will be feeling the consequences for years to come. So to the extent that the baby's health is also a measure of the mother's health, it's kind of a window into what's happening to the mother that might be affecting her health in the future. Luz Maria Hernández saw the damage after the raid. You are creating in this country like classes of citizens that is going to come back later in the years in the history of this country. The Department of Justice lost a fight this week to stop two undocumented teenage girls in detention facilities from having abortions. The two girls are known only as Jane Poe and Jane Rowe, and their suit follows the October case of Jane Doe, who successfully sued the U.S. government for failing to provide access to abortion services. This afternoon, a document unsealed in the D.C. District Court revealed that one of the two teenage girls, Jane Poe, had been requesting an abortion for a pregnancy that resulted from rape. This document makes clear why the Office of Refugee Resettlement keeps fighting what's so far been a losing battle. That's because the director, Scott Lloyd, 
believes that allowing the abortion to proceed amounts to being asked to participate in killing a human being in our care. The filings reveal some pretty disturbing facts about Jane Poe's circumstances. Poe was assaulted in her home country, crossed the border several weeks after, where she was apprehended and brought into ORR's care. When it was confirmed she was likely pregnant as a result of a rape, she asked for an abortion. Poe changed her mind briefly when her mother and potential sponsor threatened to beat her if she went through with the procedure. She ultimately decided she wanted an abortion anyway. But Lloyd personally decided it was not in her best interest or the interest of her child. Lloyd is a Trump appointee with a long background in pro-life advocacy, but even this is extreme. For example, most states that prohibit state funding for abortions also make rape exceptions. Lloyd doesn't. He says abortion will not undo or erase the memory of the violence committed against her. And more pointedly, that abortion has the ultimate destruction of another human being as its goal. Bob Carey had Scott Lloyd's job before Scott Lloyd. He says this level of intervention in a girl's pregnancy is unprecedented. My understanding of the law as it was explained to me by um, attorneys within Health and Human Services was that in the cases of rape or incest, where a minor elects to pursue termination of a pregnancy, that that is what they are entitled to do. So I did not, as the director of ORR, um, make an assessment about the right of uh, a pregnant young woman in ORR care to have an abortion. That's a legal matter that is outside of the purview of the director of ORR, as I understand it. We reached out to Lloyd's office and they had no additional comment. Jane Doe, Roe, and Poe have all had the paths cleared for their procedures only after taking their fights to court. And it looks like every girl who wants an abortion while in Scott Lloyd's care is going to have to do the same. see the photos of me. Okay, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll get the photos. Santa is fluffy, <laughs> soft. <laughs> yeah, he's cuddly. <laughs> if you come in mind of what Santa looks like, that's what he looks just like that, except he's brown, chocolate. This one's when I was one. This one is when I was two. If my memory serves me well, I think he's actually a preacher. I sure hope that's accurate. And this is when I was six. What did you say about him shaking hands? Oh, when he, it looked like he, he brokered the deal and he gets all the toys this Christmas to be shook on it. I don't know anything about his personal life. I just know him as Santa. Make that try! Make it jiggle, 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 make it jiggle. Santa Claus is real, but he doesn't live at the North Pole. He's 75 years old and he lives in New Orleans' seventh floor. Every year for the past 45 years, Fred Parker has been dressing up as Santa. To people in New Orleans, this guy is the real thing. When did you decide, you know what, I'm going to be Santa Claus? I've been thinking about that question all day. I knew it was coming. <laughs> right. And I don't know the best answer for you. Hmm. I never planned this. The only thing I can say is a gift from heaven. God put me where I need to be with this. For a lot of people, the idea of a black Santa just seems like another example of people trying to make everything PC. How do you just revise it, you know, in the middle of the legacy of the story and change Santa from white to black? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't. The tradition of black Santa goes back at least to 1936, when famous entertainer Bill Bojangles Robinson showed up in Harlem dressed up as St. Nick. By the late 1960s, civil rights leaders were starting to advocate for more black Santas because white store owners wouldn't let them in. But black Santa had already arrived in pop culture, and the question of Santa's race turned into a full-blown controversy. <laughs> Who are you? It's Mr. Jefferson dressed up like Santa. Come on. Right around this time, Fred Parker was working as a bus driver. One year, he dressed up as Santa Claus, and he bought his entire bus McDonald's. From then on, he was a Seventh Ward Santa. All right, you know, you didn't tell me what you want for Christmas. I want a game. You want a game? 
Merry Christmas to you. You can go there, man. Santa is a big deal. I saw some mom talking on Facebook today in a mom's group I'm in, and she was saying how she used Santa to keep her children in check all the time. Thank you. All right, what you want anyway? And you've been bad and you want toys. You're going to go tell her you're going to improve, okay? I want to hear you. Tell her loud. All right. It is important that Santa looks like you, replicates, you know, somebody that you can look at and say, okay, yeah, that's realistic. That Santa will come to my house. For me, this is really just about representation. And so this was just a part of my childhood, and I want to share that with him and have representation. So when he grows up, he'll be like, yeah, Santa Claus is a black man. Santa it's a great Claus song. A black man. Exactly. Santa Claus is a black man. Right. Merry Christmas to all of you. Bye, Santa Claus. Bye, Santa Claus. I was like, my grandma took a picture of him. <laughs> oh, look, like my whole family took a picture of him. My baby got to take a picture. Give me take it. Got your camera phone? Go okay, ahead. give it. Wait, give me that pretty girl. Hey, baby girl. Young lady came to me today with a baby. Her mother had made pictures with me. She had pictures with me. And this is her first baby she brought today. Is this the first time you've had three generations? No, I've had four. You've had four generations? Yes. What's that feel like? <laughs> it makes me warm inside when I think about that I'm making people happy. Hey, hey, how you doing, my brother? All right. <laughs> I'm gonna rock back and come up. Now come up. All right. There we go. Got it. Yes, indeed. All right, Sam. See you. All right. You ever thought about retiring? God will have to retire me from this one. As long as I'm able, I'll do it. So you never stop of your own will. My standing order to my daughter is at my demise. Have somebody shave me. Don't kill that image with children. Let it roll, you know, let's, don't ever do anything to blemish the image of Santa. Why is that so important to you? It's important to me that the children see something that they really believe in. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, December 21st.